So uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, this is uh, Olga Summers' doctoral defense. The title of her dissertation is an exploration of the value of cooperative inquiry for transpersonal psychology, education, and research, a theoretical and qualitative inquiry. And uh, we have with us, uh, my name is Jorge Ferrer. I'm the chair of the dissertation. I'm faculty in the East West Psychology Program and the Integral Transpersonal Hold uh, as on Jungian and archetypal psychologies. And his orientation is transpersonal depth, humanistic psychology, and also with emphasis on multiculturalism and uh, and indigenous wisdom. And our external member is Greg Lahoud, and even if he's not here as yet with us, uh, I think it's important to introduce him as well. He's the director of the Center for Relational Spirituality in Australia. He's an anthropologist and a gestalt therapist. He's an expert on cooperative inquiry and collaborated with John Heron for many years, uh, running cooperative inquiries. And he's a widely published author in the fields of transpersonal psychology, transpersonal anthropology, birth psychology, gestalt therapy, and uh, mm, and philosophy, something else. <laughs> so Greg is not here with us for now, so hopefully he'll join us later. So I'll just very, very brief, uh, just to, um, simply to mention before uh, I pass the word to our candidate. Um, a doctoral defense uh, is a public event, so you are all here. Uh, it's a participatory event, uh, and it's also a rite of passage. So, um, with all that of purchases, some of the most important thing is that everybody who participates, who is here with Olga, is accompanying her. So it's not just, she's going through the threshold, but all of us are here. And so I would like to invite you to, uh, to be especially mindful and to act as a deep listening, as an act of generosity and mindfulness to accompany Olga in this, in this threshold and in this rite of passage. So without further ado, um, uh, Olga is going to present her work and then later we'll have some time for the committee members to ask questions and uh, hopefully also some time for the audience. Uh, thank you all for being here. Olga, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Jorge. Um, yeah, it feels really exciting to be sharing this very long many year process with you all and I'm just delighted that so many of you are here from all over the world and um, country. Um, it's definitely a little bit of a stretch to be doing this entirely virtually but then again I guess we get to share it with with our friends in Europe and all over so thank you for being here. And uh, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to help, help all of us and help me join in connection with each other, um, even through these screens as we're all over the world. So if you'd like, for a couple of minutes, you might close your eyes or just soften your gaze and feel the waves of breath in your body. You might bring a kind hand to your chest. And allow yourself to take in this moment of connection with yourself and with your loving, beating heart. Let's take three deep breaths together here, breathing in and out calling in presence, letting go of distraction, and one more time like that. And I call on the words of one co-inquirer in this research as an invocation of connection with ourselves and with each other. When I feel my heart in its beat, I can hear every other heart in the universe and yet I can distinguish its unique voice. May we join for these couple of hours together with this balanced honoring of our uniqueness and our togetherness, which I see to be the two pillars of cooperative inquiry. So let's take another full breath. 
And if you haven't already, you can return to eyes open, connecting with the other faces and names perhaps. We've got some ample time to do that at the beginning, which is a blessing. So thank you. And as I begin, I wanna share a little background that inspired me in the direction of this research. As some of you know, um, before graduate school, I found myself for two years working in the research branch of a yoga center. And back then, 23 years old, with an undergraduate background in psychology, religious studies, and a deep passion for yoga, I arrived eager to learn more about the, the gifts and mechanisms of yoga pr practice, and perhaps even novel directions for the application of this ancient tradition among contemporary seekers, seekers of, of health, spirituality, and well-being. And the specific orientation of the yoga center emphasized self-inquiry. So perhaps naively, I expected that we would apply the creative and openly inquiring sensibility of our yoga practice to our research. I became gradually disillusioned, however, with the way that our research methods were oriented mostly toward replicating what was well known in the yoga tradition in the more accepted language of science. Mostly we were using um, quantitative psychometric questionnaires and occasionally qualitative interviews in this effort. While I could then, and still do certainly, appreciate the importance of validating spiritual knowledge within the modern scientific paradigm, as it serves our understanding of these powerful practices and promotes access to them, my personal curiosity and thirst for exploration and discovery remained unquenched, at least in that branch of my time there. Um, I went on to do life coaching training, more yoga training, and uh, really loved being in community there. But it, it wasn't um, until later that I came across participatory action research. Um, I, in my personal reading, I discovered these other types of research that were rooted in lived experience, collaborative, and oriented toward the possibility of new discoveries and transformation arising through the research process itself. Then, in my first year of the East-West Psychology Master's Program at CIS, I finally experienced a form of participatory inquiry that brought this way of doing research to life. And specifically, this was in a course with Dr. Jorge Ferrer, my chair, so thank you, Jorge, um, in the method that he founded called Embodied Spiritual Inquiry. And for the first time, I got to experience directly the creativity and openness and power of this kind of approach to learning and research. Within the course, I and my peers got to join in as co-researchers and we turned inward to our personal and shared experiences as the fertile ground of our study. The outcomes of this inquiry became the first qualitative study in this dissertation and I'll share a little more from that shortly. My experience with that inquiry process bolstered my passion for participatory thinking and inspired the larger arc of this dissertation. I knew right away that I wanted more practical experience with this kind of collaborative research, but I also wanted to dive into the larger context of transpersonal psychology and the seemingly limited application of participatory methods in the field. Um, this gap seemed incongruent to me with the growing popularity of participatory perspectives in contemporary transpersonal theory. And in very brief, um, that's the, the network of perspectives that hold the nature of reality and knowledge as a living and co-creative endeavor. I also came to focus specifically on cooperative inquiry, the participatory method that originally inspired Jorge's embodied spiritual inquiry. And I started looking for more examples of this type of research in the transpersonal field. Much to my surprise, although the method came out of a similar historical context as transpersonal psychology, and most of the early inquiries were transpersonal or psychological or spiritual in nature, um, cooperative inquiry was rarely used in contemporary transpersonal research. 
Seeking to understand this, I launched into the theoretical study in this dissertation, which looks deeper into the persistent critiques and challenges in transpersonal psychology that could be a factor in the a field's reticence to employ participatory methods. At the same time, I realized that bolstering participatory praxis in transpersonal studies could in turn address some of the limitations that the field has been struggling with since the beginning. Meanwhile, I also tended to the practical heart of this dissertation and I launched a cooperative inquiry into an area that was aligned with the other branches of my professional life. Um, which focus on holistic and spiritual counseling. In this inquiry, including myself and six other co-inquirers, we explored our experiences of our authentic selves. And I'm happy to see some of you here. Um, so to recap, this dissertation includes two qualitative studies and one theoretical paper that are woven together with introductory and transition chapters and an overall conclusion. While doing one cooperative, in, or one cooperative inquiry may have been a little bit more streamlined and um, something that I certainly fantasized about during the dark nights of my research, I chose this approach because I wanted to both gain practical experience with cooperative inquiry, while at the same time engaging the meta questions around participatory theory and practice in the transpersonal field. It seemed to me that while participatory perspectives were uh, lucidly elaborated theoretically, cooperative inquiry and related approaches could support enacting these visions more fully in practice. And on another practical level, I personally wanted to learn more about how to facilitate cooperative inquiry out of a sense that methodologies like this, um, that leverage collaborative knowing and active learning on the ground through experience, um, that methods like this would be a valuable asset in addressing our contemporary spiritual, social, and ecological crises. Um, this feels even more true today than when I began this, this research. And I sense that as more of us awaken to the urgent collective calls to contribute in these areas, collaborative and active inquiry approaches will become not only useful, but essential. And being the multi-passionate person that I am, I also wanted to dive in as a co-inquirer to an inquiry that was relevant to my personal growth and my active counseling practice. As I mentioned, this notion of an authentic self or a true self to which so many spiritual and psychological traditions aspire. So with this background and mapping of the three components of this dissertation, I'll now hone in on uh, the topic and overarching aims. Then I'll touch on the three studies. And finally, I'll turn to the overarching findings of the dissertation as a whole, as well as the limitations and promising future directions of this research. And now I will share to my PowerPoint. So give me just a moment to get that set up. And Okay, do you see that? <laughs> You've got the PowerPoint on screen, great. Thank you. This is a lot of technical juggling. So thank you all for accompanying me through this. <sighs> so as I've been setting up, the primary research objective of this dissertation was to explore the value of um, cooperative inquiry for transpersonal psychology, education, and research. I unfolded this objective in three parts as I described. I also pursued two secondary research objectives through the qualitative inquiries, um, aiming to contribute experiential insights regarding their domains of inquiry and elaborating the transformative outcomes that were reported by co-inquirers. 
While I was interested in the implications of cooperative inquiry for holistic learning, psycho-spiritual growth, and research more broadly, I delimited the study to the transpersonal field specifically in order to narrow the research space and to ground the literature review within established bodies of knowledge. And for our purposes today, briefly, I'll provide one of my favorite definitions of transpersonal psychology, originating from key figures in transpersonal research, Rosemary Anderson and William Broad. Transpersonal psychology is the study and cultivation of the highest and most transformative human values and potentials. Individual, communal, and global that reflect the mystery and interconnectedness of life, including our human journey within the cosmos. So uh, a vast and inspiring mission to aspire towards, right? I also want to acknowledge that my focus on participatory streams of thought in transpersonal studies were delimited to postmodern Western cultural contexts. So specifically, I focused on the participatory approach of Jorge Ferrer, informed by Tarnas and Varela, Thompson and Roche, and the participatory inquiry paradigm of John Heron and Peter Reason. And now, um, with all of this talk of cooperative inquiry, let's look more closely at the method and its origins. Just a moment, I'm getting dry. <laughs> Cooperative inquiry is a participatory and intersubjective or relational approach to research, learning, and psycho-spiritual growth. The method's founder, John Heron, reflected that the method emerged in his early phenomenological research, um, sitting face-to-face -face with another, studying the experience of mutual eye-gazing in interpersonal encounters. This was in England in the late 1960s, concurrent with the emergence of transpersonal psychology as well. Through this early research, as well as his involvement in experiential humanistic groups, um, John Heron became convinced that research of human experience was best served through direct inquiry from within as a participating subject in collaboration with others who are mutually engaged. While this may seem a little obvious or like common sense, it actually stands in contrast to the, the typical external researcher stance in which an objective researcher outside enrolls research participants to study and make meaning about. This was certainly the prevalent arrangement in social science and psychological research at that time and largely remains the case today. In contrast, cooperative inquiry strives to facilitate a non-hierarchical power dynamic by involving all participants um, in the research as empowered co-researchers, while also integrating the initiating researcher as a subject of um, inquiry. This format is informed by two participatory principles. First, the principle of epistemic participation um, which holds that knowledge is an interactive or inactive process co-created between inquirers and their subjects of inquiry, whether that's within themselves or in the world. And also the principle of political participation, which upholds the basic human right of research subjects to participate fully in designing research that intends to gather knowledge about them. That's a quotation from Heron and Reason. This principle also highlights the importance of being conscious about who it is that's given the right to create knowledge. Recall that uh, from a participatory perspective, what is forwarded as knowledge is shaped by the individual lenses, biases, as well as the cultural and social positionality of the researcher. And at the same time, then the messages and worldviews that are conveyed through research play a role in shaping our current and future realities. 
Um, so this factor of whose voice is included in knowledge making is considered consciously in cooperative inquiry and related methods. As the methods founder John Heron and his collaborator Peter Reason often emphasized, cooperative inquiry is a way of doing research with rather than on or about people. And in this language, you might hear the cultural milieu out of which both transpersonal psychology and cooperative inquiry emerge. The revolutionary backdrop of post-World Wars Europe and Vietnam War era United States, influenced by the ethos that was fundamental to the civil rights movement and the human potential movement, both characterized by progressive urges toward new heights of uh, social justice and human flourishing. After about 10 years of workshop application and preliminary inquiries with co-counselors, Heron and Reason launched the first inquiry into, um, uh, with a group of doctors exploring whole person medicine. And around this time, Heron began an independent research career initiating a variety of spiritual and psychological inquiries in um, Italy and New Zealand and the UK, while Peter Reason became the director for the Center of Action Research and Professional Practice at a UK university. Beyond these founding applications by Heron and Reason um, in transpersonal studies and professional practice specifically, the method has now been applied in a variety of disciplines including medicine, technology, education, social justice, psychology, and spirituality. Um, while cooperative inquiry is still marginal in the dominant research paradigm, the method is gaining validation and is maturing in its early stages of application across disciplines. Now let's turn to the cooperative inquiry methodology specifically. In a cooperative inquiry, a small non-hierarchical group gather together um, to, with a shared question or concern, often initiated by one or two inquirers or within a pre-existing group. Then after some reflection on the issue and time spent building a safe um, interpersonal container for the inquiry, the group creates cycles of action and reflection. These cycles then build on each other a minimum of five to eight times or until a satisfactory outcome is reached. Um, possible inquiry actions are quite open-ended to address the inquiry question at hand, possibly involving interpersonal, contemplative, or creative expressive practices. And there's openness to multiple ways of knowing. Procedures to enhance validity are used throughout and data can be recorded or collected in the form of audio or video recording, notes, reflective writing, art, or whatever is deemed appropriate by the group. And in some cases, um, co-inquirers might analyze this collected data and report the outcomes to outside audiences. Although the conceptual outcomes are um, valued and certainly generated, the lived impact on co-inquirers and their inquiry domain are considered primary. And on a fundamental level, um, the process supports co-inquirers to discover authentic relationships with each other, cultivating both personal autonomy and group collaboration. So the Cooperative inquiry method, as you might be gathering, is quite malleable, but it has several underlying features that are of particular value and um, especially in transpersonal context. Um, the method is experiential, drawing on the immediate experience of action phases. It is holistic, open to multiple ways of knowing and potentially leveraging state-specific knowledge, such as knowledge that's accessed in expanded states of consciousness. Um, it is relational or intersubjective, involving all collaboration at all levels of the inquiry process, from research design to meaning making. And it's transformative in that the inquiry process in itself 
um, is intended to meaningfully transform co-inquirers and their worlds. This feature is especially important uh, in the context of transpersonal validity, where both informative or conceptual outcomes and transformative dimensions of research are valued and honored. After all, transpersonal research aims not only to generate information, but to cultivate wisdom, which comes through the meaningful transformation of ourselves, our uh, co-researchers, and the audience of the research. Now, let's turn more um, specifically to each of the three studies in this dissertation. Um, the first study built upon the literature review that was established in the introductory chapters to examine the theoretical value of cooperative inquiry in the context of transpersonal psychology. This article is entitled Addressing Persistent Challenges in Transpersonal Psychology, Cooperative Inquiry as an Innovative Response. And it'll soon be published in the next um, journal of, the, of transpersonal psychology. Um, and in this project, I mainly engaged a literature review applying three main theoretical lenses. That was participatory theory, um, transpersonal feminist theory, and multicultural theory arising out of transpersonal studies or contained within transpersonal studies. In addition, I looked at more general perspectives highlighted by prominent transpersonal scholars to reflect on some of the persistent challenges that have been named repeatedly in the field. In the article, in the inquiry, I organized the critiques into three interconnected categories, cultural bias and limited diversity, or more specifically, Western patriarchal bias, um, limited social engagement, and limited research. Then I looked at cooperative inquiries in related disciplines to address uh, or to envision prospective opportunities that might address these challenges in the future. I also discussed the strengths and limitations of cooperative inquiry in the context of transpersonal validity standards. And ultimately, um, in that study, I asserted that cooperative inquiry may be an important resource for addressing the persistent challenges in contemporary transpersonal psychology, thus helping the field to fulfill its missions of personal and collective transformation. Um, and then the second arc of this dissertation employed two qualitative research studies. The first study was an embodied spiritual inquiry into the nature of human boundaries within and between co-inquirers. Um, as I mentioned, this took place in Jorge's course back in 2013 with um, 12 CIS students from different programs, three men and nine women. Um, maybe Ross is still here. Thanks, Ross. Um, and in the course, we, we learned about cooperative inquiry as well as the interactive embodied meditations of Marina Romero and Ramon Albareda, which I'll be sharing a few photos in these slides. The basic structure of the inquiry included cycles of action and reflection, like in cooperative inquiry, but using interactive embodied meditations as the primary inquiry tool for um, action phases. Reflection took place between uh, meditations individually, in dyads, in small groups, and large groups. And since I'm showing these images of embodied, uh, interactive embodied meditations, um, a bit briefly, these are partner meditations that involve mindful physical contact between two or more partners. This body of work, um, as I mentioned from Marina Romero and um, Ramon Albareda, I see a typo in the slide, um, they, they hold that there are multiple intelligences that can be activated through conscious touch of specific areas uh, on the body. These include the feet and legs, as you see here. Um, those correspond with the body itself. 
the, the lower belly corresponding with the vital or creative center, the, the heart um, or the center of the chest that corresponds with the heart, and the head corresponding with the mind, and sometimes um, the top of the head corresponding with, with consciousness. So after we were introduced to, the, to this inquiry process and the meditations, we collaboratively decided to focus our remaining time on the following question. What are the experiential differences between dissociation, merging, and integration contingent on boundary firmness and permeability within both interpersonal and intrapersonal domains? Then we engaged in several more rounds of guided um, meditations to deepen into our inquiry. And throughout, we audio recorded our reflection dialogues. We took photos of our uh, integrative drawings between meditations, and we wrote final reflection papers, which all became data um, that was later analyzed. And then in the year or so after the course, I developed the fruits of this process with another co-inquirer, as I named Ross Bowman, um, under the supervision of Jorge into an inquiry report and a methodological example. Um, and the main informative or conceptual finding of this inquiry that we came to was that boundaries were experienced in terms of their um, dynamic effects versus um, static qualities. Uh, we also found a relationship between dissociation and overly firm boundaries, as well as integration and merging and varied combinations of firm and permeable boundaries. And finally, the inquiry highlighted the phenomenon of shared emergent experiences between co-inquirers, which were demonstrated through similar qualities, um, intuitive impressions or images that were discovered only after the meditations between partners. Um, this finding, although it was preliminary, supported the possible existence of transpersonal morphic resonance or, or morphic fields and demonstrated a fertile area for future research. And then in the second study, um, I, just to pause for a second, I'm hearing a little bit of sound, um, if everybody can make sure that you're on mute. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so the second study, um, here I initiated a full form cooperative inquiry to explore the experience of the authentic self. Um, the guiding question for me was around the prominence of a, a true self or an authentic self in the, as a theoretical construct in psychology and spirituality uh, with little experiential research into how this phenomenon is um, experienced by living people. So this, this study set out to address this gap in the literature uh, and exploring the authentic self that is, as it is experientially encountered and lived. In the inquiry, I gathered a small group of seven co-inquirers, including myself, on this adventure to ask, what is my experience of my authentic self, um, which we also extrapolated to uh, hypothetical, what is the experience of the authentic self? The inclusion criteria for participating in this study were simply to be self-identified on a path of psycho-spiritual growth um, and interested in exploring the authentic self in an experiential and collaborative context. I recruited co-inquirers from CIIS and the Hakomi um, Mindful Somatic Psychotherapy Communities. And I was happy to be joined in um, nine cycles of inquiry that were conducted together in person um, and also within our daily lives between meetings over the course of six months. And I know some of you are here. Thank you for joining. Um, and this, this article is, was recently published in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. 
um, during the inquiry, we engaged in a variety of activities like group dialogues where we tried to bracket our socialized selves. Um, we created visual representations of our self maps as depicted on this slide. Um, and we, we shared in periods of self-disclosure and witnessing. We also spent time in more individualized inquiry uh, in our personal lives, like paying greater attention to moments of felt authenticity or inauthenticity in relationship. Um, we spent time following our authentic self impulses and exploring our sense of authentic self in, in nature. And after the main inquiry process, including a couple of rounds of group reflection and analysis um, and discussion, I conducted a preliminary thematic analysis and uh, presented an outline to the group for comments and revisions. And after that process, uh, where we came was uh, to six interconnected themes, including um, presence and flow, somatic awareness and vitality, expression of truth, multidimensionality and integration, impulses and values, and dynamism and relationality. And I also elaborated the, uh, the practical and transformative outcomes that were reported by co-inquirers. And while much could be shared um, about these outcomes, what felt most pertinent and interesting for me to highlight um, was that our inquiry emphasized the relational dimensions of self or that the authentic self felt to be embedded in relationships, whether those were relationships with, with ourselves, um, between our multiple parts, with our friends, family, or community, or with nature and cosmos. And this finding um, stands out to me because in a way it contrasts some of the early notions in humanistic psychology that emphasize the authentic self um, as being forged uh, distinct from and against um, outside social influences and contexts. Uh, however, this finding seems consistent with the contemporary socio-cultural turn in humanistic psychology and the participatory turn in transpersonal psychology, as well as trends in contemporary authenticity research, um, which hold the self as contextual or relational also. And I plan to engage this discussion and otherwise place our inquiry findings into dialogue with existing literature and research on the authentic self in, um, in a future article. I'm going to take a deep breath and I invite you to do so too, if that would be nourishing. Okay, so taking all of three studies together and the multiple vantage points that they provided on the broader research objective, exploring the value of cooperative inquiry in transpersonal psychology, education, and research. I'll share some overarching conclusions. At the level of theory, investigating the ongoing challenges in transpersonal psychology um, and uh, as well as cooperative inquiry implementation in related disciplines, that process clearly demonstrated that there is, in fact, much opportunity for cooperative inquiry in these contexts. Through my long literature review, extensive literature review, I concluded that cooperative inquiry is, in fact, a viable and valid approach to learning and research within transpersonal contexts with the potential to remedy some of the longstanding challenges of the field and thus strengthen the capacity of the field to contribute more optimally um, to the social, ecological, and spiritual domains that the field seeks to address. But of course, um, because participatory learning and research methods are best served through, uh, through living practice, my research urged me to go beyond theory. And it was there on the ground through the qualitative inquiries 
um, that I gained an inside perspective on the, the, pers the unique gifts and um, challenges of the method. Um, and as I zoomed out, uh, perhaps most importantly, I could see that co-inquirers in both studies reported personal benefits and positive life changes as a result of their participation. This outcome corroborated the potentially transformative and even healing dimensions of cooperative inquiry that have been um, highlighted by other authors in different disciplines. Um, Co-inquirer accounts in the authentic self-study also suggested that the intentional group process that we engaged provided something of a missing experience for some co-inquirers, providing a safe space for group holding, attunement, and mirroring. Um, in for example, co-inquirers describe the benefits of being able to rest into the group container, which perhaps allowed their nervous systems to relax in a way that was distinct from solitary or one-on-one -on -one processes. Relatedly, the conducted inquiries supported the premise that cooperative inquiry in any area can serve as a participatory or relational spiritual practice. Specifically, cooperative inquiry offers a conscious group process that fosters co-inquire autonomy while teaching tools for genuine relationship and collaboration. Um, things like mutual decision-making processes, balancing inquirer speaking time, attending to less dominant perspectives, and so on. And my experience and the experience of co-inquirers certainly supported this stance, suggesting that the methodology can have an important skill building and even healing function in contemporary Western cultures. And I later reflected that cooperative inquiry may offer a useful remedy for both the hyper-individualism and the conventional hierarchies that are common within learning and spiritual contexts. Trends that paradoxically exalt the importance of individuality while actually disallowing uh, true autonomy. In contrast, cooperative inquiry has the potential to promote uh, personal autonomy in learning and spiritual exploration, while at the same time inviting the creativity and synergy of collaboration. And finally, this dissertation posited that cooperative inquiry and related methods um, may offer a means for enacting the participatory turn in transpersonal studies and beyond. And my experience in the applied components of this research supported this view. And specifically, I came to understand that cooperative inquiry can foster participatory worldviews on two levels. Um, what already popped up on process and outcomes. At the level of process, engaging in cooperative inquiry provides an experiential immersion in participatory learning and spirituality. That is, rather than purely following existing traditions, teachings, or schools, co-inquirers get to have the opportunity to create something new and unique together within uh, an intentionally structured format. And it's worth noting that this arrangement is actually quite rare in um, educational and spiritual communities, which tend to emphasize, um, they, they tend to emphasize the transmission of existing practices and knowledge over creative possibilities that are potentiated through direct experience and exploration. And again, in contrast, the radically open and collaborative format of cooperative inquiry opens a multitude of diverse and novel vistas that are likely to be of pedagogical and spiritual significance.
And then at the level of outcomes, the inquiry format also allows for experientially based um, emergent and participatory knowledge to be co-created. So meaning beyond passing down established knowledge, the format of cooperative inquiry emphasizes the possibility of personally authentic um, new discoveries. And overall, the combined outcomes of these projects provide a strong foundation to suggest that cooperative inquiry is well suited for and has unique features to enrich transpersonal psychology, education, and research. Of course, as with any research, this dissertation and the studies that it contained had some limitations. And given the multi-layered format, I considered them from several angles in the dissertation. Um, that was in response to the central research purpose uh, regarding cooperative inquiry and embodied spiritual inquiry as methodologies in general, and uh, regarding the limitations of the qualitative studies specifically. And here I'll focus on the limitations regarding the work as a whole. And mainly, um, the, this dissertation was limited by the scope of the present study in contrast with the multitude of examples that would be required to make more assured claims regarding the value of cooperative inquiry in various transpersonal contexts. In other words, cooperative inquiries would need to be conducted with diverse populations and within a variety of con contexts to extend and substantiate the claims of this dissertation. And the theoretical study was also limited by the fact that um, there were few existing examples of cooperative inquiries in, in the transpersonal field specifically. So the literature review relied heavily on inquiries in related disciplines, which I then extended into a projective assessment of future opportunities. However, it will certainly take the actual application of these suggestions to demonstrate the viability uh, and the outcomes of actual cooperative inquiries. And in addition, the, the two qualitative studies, although they did provide an experiential component that was essential, they serve as a narrow sample size of two. Um, and ultimately, it will take numerous other examples within diverse groups and contexts to apprehend the strengths and challenges of cooperative inquiry in the transpersonal field. And the strengths, as well as the limitations of this dissertation, they opened a variety of avenues for future research in the direction of uh, extending the qualitative studies, and furthering the dissertation's main research objective regarding cooperative inquiry in transpersonal contexts and beyond. The qualitative studies in this dissertation illuminated numerous paths for future research, and I will share some today. First, Keeping the methodology and the inquiry topics consistent, it would be valuable to repeat these inquiries with diverse groups. Because the outcomes of cooperative inquiry and embodied spiritual inquiry are, are participatory and thus contextual, um, it's of course expected that different group constellations would yield different perspectives, processes, and outcomes on these inquiry topics. Um, in particular, the outcomes of participatory research are invariably shaped by the, the social positionality of co-inquirers and the various interlocked sources of privilege and oppression. So it would be important to include demographic, sociocultural, and intellectual or ideological diversity in future research groups. This could be done by attending more specifically to social intersectionality or by involving um, uh, people from diverse intellectual or cultural or ideological backgrounds. So it, mainly people that have different and varied perspectives. Um, repeated inquiries would likely provide more diverse and encompassing accounts of these inquiry topics 
while also clarifying the role of conceptual pre-understandings and beliefs in shaping the inquiry outcomes. And then it would also be valuable to investigate these inquiry topics using alternative research methods. Um, for example, research methods that have a more solitary or um, that use a conventional researcher participant hierarchy in contrast with the relational and um, collaborative features of cooperative inquiry and embodied spiritual inquiry. Um, in the case of the authentic self study, it would certainly be revealing to see if alternative research methods corroborate or perhaps challenge the relational emphasis that we um, focused on in our study. Also, making connections between, um, uh, between cooperative inquiry outcomes and relevant quantitative measures could open um, fertile dialogue in the future. Um, for example, there are authenticity inventories that could be applied before and after participation in an inquiry like the one we conducted uh, to see if there's some kind of um, a psychometrically measurable change that is tracked between before and after participation. And um, the outcomes of both inquiries, as I alluded to throughout, also opened other questions or topics like um, transpersonal morphic resonance or a sense of a group authentic self that came up that could be a fruitful basis for future research. And finally, contextualizing these findings within existing theoretical perspectives and uh, empirical research would be worthwhile in the future. Now, um, turning to the future opportunities to extend the primary research aim of this dissertation. First, there are ample opportunities for cooperative inquiry to address some of the specific challenges in transpersonal psychology, including um, inquiries into culturally biased assumptions in transpersonal theory and practice, intergroup inquiries exploring mutual goals or challenges within diverse groups. Um, for example, in this, in this domain, you could have a group of um, women, men, and non-binary individuals exploring visions of post-patriarchal society or exploring masculine and feminine archetypes. Um, then there are opportunities for um, groups that focus on healing internalized oppression or confronting privilege based uh, or pri confronting privilege that are based on social identity as well as between spiritual communities. And finally, future inquiries could focus on cultivating epistemic diversity in transpersonal research by incorporating multiple ways of knowing explicitly, um, perhaps state-specific knowledge, um, expanded states of consciousness, or collaboration with non-human intelligences like plants, non-human animals, or uh, the spirit of a place. And in addition, transpersonal classrooms could explore using cooperative inquiry as, as a learning model, either as an open-ended um, process or focused on specific predetermined topics. Um, cooperative inquiry could also be facilitated between practitioner groups or communities around certain questions or skills. Um, for example, you could have a group of counselors from different therapeutic backgrounds exploring together optimal practices for supporting client transformation. And then, of course, um, cooperative inquiry within the, the broader transpersonal community or other communities organized around shared values and concerns. Um, for example, inquiries into optimal responses for um, or to specific social, ecological, um, spiritual crises could be very potent um, if conducted within diverse groups. 
Certainly right now as um, the fires rage in California, collaborative spaces of support to metabolize climate grief and trauma, um, finding pathways into restorative action are a deep need. And finally, um, cooperative inquiry could serve as a foundational practice for transpersonal groups to explore and cultivate authentic spirituality. And as may be becoming evident, the opportunities are really endless. Um, then when there's a greater body of applied research uh, that has been generated, it would be important to revisit um, this study and the unique challenges and opportunities that cooperative inquiry presents within different contexts. So in, in that sense, I feel this dissertation offers um, seeds that could be potentiated into many diverse future fruits. And as I reflect, um, the multifaceted arc of this dissertation, including the independent projects and the meta inquiry that ties them together, has guided for me um, an illuminating, humbling, and growth inspiring process. As I intended, I feel I gained valuable experience as uh, a co inquirer and initiator of cooperative inquiry, meanwhile, engaging in the overarching investigation of the role of the method if, in, uh, if it was implemented more readily within transpersonal psychology, education, research, and of course, beyond. As a result, I feel more rooted in transpersonal studies um, as a field and in practice, as well as in cooperative inquiry. And I also feel that this process has confirmed my, my growing sense that participatory methods are likely to become increasingly important for meeting the dynamic challenges now facing humanity and the earth. Um, yeah. Although it's still my sense that executing, executing these, these interrelated projects was likely more demanding um, than perhaps unfolding one of them into a conventional dissertation, um, I am ultimately grateful for the process because participating in the multiple inquiries offered me invaluable personal and experiential insight into the dissertation's purpose that theoretical study, for example, could not have provided alone. And at the same time, this, this approach allowed me to deepen into my broader interests regarding transpersonal psychology, um, participatory theory and praxis, and holistic methodologies of learning and research. So at this culmination point, I feel fulfilled and grateful for the many branched tree that this dissertation has become. And it's my sincere hope that this research serves as a foundation and inspiration for, for many like-hearted future co-inquirers um, who take up the creative efforts suggested here. May it be so. And in closing, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to my committee for <laughs> guiding me on this process. Thank you. Um, also, thank you to my co-inquirers in this research who were essential. Um, and my family, especially my husband, Sam Somer, who supported me as I took on this journey simultaneously with parenthood. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> and to our precious son, Julian, and my dear friends who walked this path uh, before and alongside me. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. Um, I will stop the share and return to you all for questions. Um, hi. Let's see, I think I see you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, for, for this 
very clear and well-organized presentation. I see Greg is here with us. Welcome, hey. Greg. Very good. Good to see you. Yeah, good to be here. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm late. I, 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 I had a message saying it was starting at 7 Australian time. Okay, okay. Good but anyway, I, 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 got, I got most of it, so... Thanks. Excellent, excellent. And you have read the work, so this is, this sure. is good. I'm so glad you could make it. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to go um, now to um, the part of uh, some um, comments and questions from the committee members. And uh, normally uh, proceed um, inviting our external, mem external member to go first, and then our second member, and I will go, I will go last. So, Greg, um, I invite you to offer any comments, assessment of the work as a whole, uh, and then if you have uh, questions for our candidate, we'll have time for maybe a couple or even three questions, depending on, on the, the length of response. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I appreciate very much being part of your journey, Olga, with us, and uh, it's lovely to be here at the culmination of it and uh, it's, it's a great piece of work and I, I yeah I'm, I'm a big fan of what you've done here um, so I don't know uh, questions well it's tricky because you've answered all of my questions in the, in the written work you know but I, I suppose Thinking about it, warming up to this, I did think, um, you know, what, how, how can I ask the, a naughty question there? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, and, and I think it goes to the source material, which is, you know, John Heron's work, who I'm, I'm also a big fan of. Um, and I wonder, do you feel that you've been critical enough of him, of his work, of his uh, over, as it were? And, because you know, yeah, that that's that would be my question to you. Mm, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, my my first thought is probably offhand, maybe not, maybe not at this point, as I've been more in the, um, you know, the student, the researcher role at the beginning of my um, career, conducting cooperative inquiry. Um, yeah. So I feel like I've been more immersed and trying to take in the, the foundation that was laid before me. And I imagine in the future, there will be much opportunity to um, carry the work forward and live it forward in new and creative ways. And, and perhaps at that juncture, I'll have a more critical reflective perspective. Yeah, I mean, you did, um, you did critique uh... John's call to um, sort of end <laughs> transpersonal. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad you. I'm glad you did that. I, I did wonder if it required a bit more. You know, like a. It's a big. It's a big statement, really. Mm. And and so, someone well like myself who who share. I'm a stakeholder and collaborative inquiry like you. So when I see that, I think, oh, that's um, that's something I. I personally wouldn't endorse, nor did you. So, so I, I saw that. Um, but I wonder if that just opens the door on more uh, for you, actually, which you've answered. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe more in the future and in the present. I've definitely had um, uh, spirited conversations with John about his his critiques. Um, and maybe, maybe this will come up in the future, but I uh, worked on an interview style article with him, um, specifically looking at the opportunities for cooperative inquiry in the future in the field of transpersonal studies. And in that process, I got into um, some, like I said, spirited dynamic <laughs> conversations with him about the, the value of transpersonal studies and the new ways um, that uh, the field is being recreated and defined um, that I think actually aligns better with his with his values. Um, mm -hmm. I think he's probably critiquing a version of transpersonal psychology that was 
um, of an older generation, and he hasn't gotten to participate in what, what the um, current and vibrant community is creating now. Yeah, I, I appreciate that answer. Yeah, I think that's, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. The only other one I've got, and I, I imagine this could be done probably through a cooperative inquiry, is something like where, because, you know, like, where the place of shame in um, the inquiry process. Uh, how, I don't see anything in the, in, the, in the literature about that, and it's become quite a, a big deal in psychotherapy. Mm. And I guess when you're working with people, the same dynamics are present, whether you are in an inquiry or in a therapeutic environment, I would think. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, did, do you have any thoughts about that at all? Um, so the question is where, the where question is the place the, for the, shame? The place of shame and learning, I suppose, the place of shame and in, in, uh, in inquiry. How do you manage it? How do you speak to it? How do you... And, and as I say, may, maybe it's a redundant question and that it's one of those research areas that you've already pointed us toward, you know. Mm. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I feel like it, there's a lot of opportunity for, for future research in that area. I mean, certainly um, this isn't my expertise, but it's my sense that the, the healing of shame is... Um, optimal when witnessed by loving others or loving others. So I could definitely see um, the cooperative inquiry context being a powerful space for that kind of work, shadow work or um, working on shame specifically. I mean, I think about the cooperative inquiries that focused on um, healing from internalized oppression. There is one that was done among a group of um, Jewish women who gradually unraveled that internalized oppression. So I imagine that they encountered um, spaces of shame and um, some of those more challenging uh, feeling feeling states. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. More opportunity in the future. Yeah. Um... Really, I think that the only two questions I have, I don't know that's probably a bit short, but um, it, it's, a, it's a comprehensive uh, uh, piece of work and, and I don't have much more to say. But, so thank you for uh, allowing me to participate uh, mm -hmm. thank from you a distance, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're all from a distance now. <laughs> we are, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you. Uh, well, hey, that, that, that's me. And thank thank you, so you again, Olga. Yeah. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you so much. Um, and um, uh, I invite Helge from your uh, Also, to any, any overall comments or assessment or appreciative or critical, whatever. And then we have some questions uh, uh, whenever, whenever you want. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Olga, yes, so first of all, congratulations. I think this is fabulous, fabulous work overall. Um, so creative, so multidimensional, thorough, well-crafted, um, really, really good. Um, like uh, Greg, as the questions popped up in my mind, either before or even during your presentation, uh, within five minutes, you answer most of them as you go along, uh, and not just one way, but another way, and uh, you know how it should be explored in the future. So, really uh, remarkable, really, really good work. I'm a, I'm a fan too. Um, thank you, thank you for that. And I'm so glad you're here at this point now. I remember when I got your final paper uh, for my <laughs> class a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I think my feedback was, whatever you do, keep writing because you are gifted and the scholar and the researcher was very visible at that time already. So as a preamble, but uh, in a non-questioning space, uh, let me ask you a critical question. So one question I have is, you know, the, one of the problem areas that you defined for, for transpersonal psychology in general, the sort of limited 
uh, scope and applicability and engagement of uh, diversity and uh, different social social realities um, and the, and and the bias that comes with that. What would you say as a as a point of uh, critique uh, if somebody said, well, you know, isn't that true also for for this work so far? And you've pointed out that it needs more diverse um, applications. Um, but that, you know, this form of inquiry, the aims of the inquiry has this sort of privileged elite, um, small segment of society access and applicability so far. Um, how, how will that change? Would you, would you say on how true that might be for, for what you've done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a really good question. Um, let me adjust. I'm on the floor here in my office, so squirming around a little bit to get comfortable. Um, well, first, first of all, um, I think that there, there have been um, inquiries that have been done in more diverse groups. Um, there's a researcher, last name is Godin, that did a variety of inquiries on community um, social justice work where she was in um, different communities in three countries, um, bringing in uh, activists from the ground to explore the, the role of love in community activism. Um, that's one example that I can think of. But I think that already, and I'm not certain of this, but I, I imagine that already as a body of work, there is more diversity included than maybe um, the general academic <laughs> uh you know transpersonal bubble um but there's certainly a lot more work to be done around that in the future where i think a cooperative inquiry has a unique um uh, resource or opportunity is that it doesn't require everyone or anyone to be a uh, an academic um <laughs> And in fact, John Heron um, critiques academia heavily and actually believes that this is a, a methodology that should be used um, on, on the ground, you know, uh, outside of academia, um, perhaps mostly, but um, he supports however it's being used or that it's being used in a broader way. Um, but that means that you can have um, already a diverse group of individuals who are engaging in a cooperative inquiry and then if they choose to publishing the outcomes of that inquiry um, it doesn't require an an academic um, researcher to be the voice um, so in that maybe there's it's probably again a future opportunity but that allows for um, the inclusion of more diverse voices um, from different segments of society to participate again in knowledge making and um, mm -hmm. yeah that can kind of uh, be accelerated over the the rate of um, that change happening within academia um, mm -hmm. because certainly that critique of transpersonal psychology can be made of academia as a whole mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for that. Um, how, you know, without expecting a formulated plan, uh, <laughs> multidimensional on how to roll something like this out, but just, you know, thinking in, in your mind, being so immersed in this topic and in the promise of uh, this work, mm -hmm. um, how would you see this sort of landing on the ground, maybe in uh, less uh you know privileged circles whether it's by education class etc cetera, etc cetera, that this could find its way into other communities that can mm -hmm. whose voices need to be heard but also who uh, could contribute their knowledge in the way that you uh, generate and contribute uh, uh, knowledge in the, in the way that you just described what would you think would be sort of mm -hmm. avenues or, or directions on how this could land in i don't know where and how yeah what, do, what are you thinking yeah um well i've i've started to generate a little um a little packet of resources that i call see cooperative inquiry bootstrapping um that 
arose out of a, a conference that Matt Siegel organized last summer um, that was looking at uh, spirituality and science and the intersection. But it landed in this small um, Telluride, Colorado community in, uh, in, around a church. Um, and I don't think they took it up, but um, at that point they were quite interested. How could we do cooperative inquiry together to, to engage in authentic spirituality and um, the questions that matter to us? So I've started gathering some um, really, in my opinion, but maybe it needs more work, um, accessible resources for how to get this started, um, including like how you would set up a, a, a safe or um, moving towards safe container for a group and um, the process step by step from like, selecting your inquiry topic or your area of concern to um, choosing the inquiry actions. Um, and certainly I think it would take um, some more work up front to learn the, the method, um, to do a little bit of reading. Um, I think John Heron and Peter Reason have a, an article called Cooperative Inquiry for Laypersons or something like that, um, which is a bit more accessible. Um, and does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. just yeah. Giving yeah. the resources out, but I think it will take a little bit of inspiring a, a group of people who want to do this. And I feel like I should also acknowledge that um, I'm talking about <laughs> this kind of method within the the bubble of transpersonal psychology or or academia and then beyond but this kind of learning and action is is not um is not actually very uh unique in other communities you know it's like i said in the beginning it seems like common sense that people who have a problem or a question might get together and do something <laughs> about it and reflect on it and you know engage in that recursively um i think what cooperative inquiry provides is is you know for for contexts such as ours here it, it provides a way back into that um more grassroots way of learning and discovery um, and for the communities maybe that you were pointing to or diverse groups of people who are not in academia, uh, it might provide a structure and a, um, perhaps even an, an empowerment piece that what, what discoveries they are coming to constitutes knowledge that can be, can be shared and should be listened to. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll leave it there in the interest of time. I, mm -hmm. Uh, could go further, but Jorge, why don't you pick it up here? Thank you, Helga. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, depending on time, we may still have some time for for any question that you may still have. Um, so um, first, to say that I, I very much agree with both uh, Greg and Helga about how exceptional uh, this situation is. And I think it's exceptional in different ways. Um, on the one hand, um, you know, this, this is like a three paper dissertation format. Uh, I've been chairing probably most of the three paper dissertations at CIS for many years. And uh, very few of them, by the time of the defense, got the three papers accepted for publication. So this is already quite exceptional. And uh, I have to stress that uh, two of the papers are being published in the flagship journals of their fields, you know, the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology is the most important journal in transpersonal psychology. The Journal of Humanistic Psychology is the most important journal in humanistic psychology. So this is quite an achievement and uh, I think that you should be commended, commended for it. And, uh, and then the other thing that uh, I think is important to, to stress or to highlight is, uh, you know, in a way, the, um, this is almost like three mini dissertation into one. <laughs> uh, you have a exceptionally well researched theoretical paper that could have been expanded into a whole dissertation. And then you have two qualitative studies. <laughs> so uh, this is already quite, quite exceptional. And, um, and also I see a lot of value in the, um, you know, normally like uh, there is this, uh, almost this tension in academia, uh, even at CIS, between theoretical dissertations on the one hand and qualitative dissertations on the other. On the other hand, we have like mixed methods. 
but mixed methods normally refer to qualitative and quantitative approaches brought together. But this kind of dissertation for me holds a lot of promise and possibility that is this mixed methods between theoretical and qualitative. I think that's a methodological uh, innovation. This is not so um, normally done. And I think you, your work shows the, the power of it, you know, how, how the theoretical work can really ground and uh, guide qualitative research and how qualitative research can in turn kind of illustrate and, um, and you know, and, and really prove some of the points of the theoretical argumentation. So I think there's a lot of power there and, uh, and I'm really, really excited about that. So um, I'm also very persuaded by the arguments about cooperative inquiry, its value in the in transpersonal psychology and like you, and I would very much love that uh, your work um, um, catalyzes many other researchers uh, to uh, unfold cooperative inquiries into the transpersonal field, but I know that's one of your aims, and I, and I believe that that will be so. So now let's go for some work. And I have uh, a few questions for you. Um, um, you know, you highlighted um, this uh, topic, uh, this emerging uh, outcome of um, um, share emerging experiences in some of the um, inquiries. And you talk about this construct of transpersonal morphic resonance as a way to explain them. And, um, and I would like uh, maybe if you could give an example so that the audience is, is really really understand what you're talking about. And I would like to invite you to um, an scholarly exercise, like how how do you think like a more um, naturalistic, positivistic psychologist would critique that point? And uh, what could be an alternative explanation for that? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, so a couple of examples that that finding of shared emergent experiences that came out of the embodied spiritual inquiry, where we were doing these partner meditations with each other. So we would be um, instructed to focus entirely on our inner experience as we were doing these meditations in pairs, or uh, I'll leave it in, in pairs. Um, so what was interesting and throughout that process we wouldn't speak with each other and then afterwards we'd go off on our own and do some drawing and reflecting and then we'd come back together and it was common um, for uh, partners to discover that there was some uh, shared element to what the, we were experiencing that couldn't be explained very easily like drawings that looked similar to one another um, or uh, um, I remember, I'm not sure, if, I think Ross had to go, but in a, a meditation where he and I worked together, we found it really interesting that we were exploring a, um, one of my centers of awareness and we both experienced it as being more, um, uh, the boundary being more firm or rigid or something like that internally. Um, this was, of course, seven years ago now, so my memory is <laughs> a little fuzzy of it. Um, and, and then at a different center, we both experienced it as being more, um, more merged or um, more easy, the boundary being more permeable. Um, and in reflection, we realized that we could feel that, that more subtle um, dimension that you couldn't uh, explain in very easily. Um, and as a final example, there were times where the whole group had some kind of theme or image that was coming through um, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't implanted beforehand. It just kind of spontaneously came forward. Um, so those are, those are some examples. Um, and in terms of how a more, you said a positivistic perspective might critique that, um, I mean, the, the only thing that comes to mind is just coincidence, chance that, you know, the, it's just, just happened that way, or you, you all are drinking the Kool-Aid, or um, I don't know, that we're, we're coming from a shared um, uh, intellectual or ideological background, and so we're able to infer these things, or that, that's the best I can do. Um, does that answer your question, Jorge? Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
So let me continue a little with a little of this kind of, kind of div positivistic devil advocate <laughs> role. Uh, and um, how would you respond to a traditional researcher's critique of the kind of uh, transformative outcomes of research that are so much emphasized in cooperative inquiry and embodied spiritual inquiry. Some traditional researchers may say, well, this is great, this is great for a growth, self-growth group, but this is not research. Uh, how do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. um, well, certainly we are operating from, um, from different parameters on what constitutes knowledge. Um, in, in cooperative inquiry, as I qualified uh, a few times, we're, we're going toward um, knowledge that is meaningful in the sense that it can create some kind of um, growth or, or change or um, is, is of uh, pertinent meaning and relevance to the group. Um, and I guess it's, I think of where I'm struggling a little bit, it, it might not be research in the sense that an objectivist, positivist scientist might look at it in terms of providing some kind of objective truth, um, because it probably does not provide that. Uh, it doesn't even uphold that there is such a thing as static objective truth. Um, but it calls me to question the the more fundamental um, uh, question here, like why why are we doing research? And in a transpersonal context, which is you know more what I'm operating within, we do research to um, to facilitate wisdom or um, meaningful uh, growth to help <laughs> to help ourselves and um, you know, the environments that we're embedded within. And in that sense, it certainly is research. It's a, you know, healing, growthful um, learning process. So yeah, we're definitely operating in different um, dimensions or camps. So there, there would probably need to be some better bridging between those worlds to facilitate more easeful communication. Mm. Thank you, yes. Uh, and of course, cooperative inquiry also delivers informative outcomes as sure. well as growth, right? But I really like this, this point you're making about research for wisdom instead of research for objective knowledge. I think that's, that's, a, really, that's a really beautiful point. Uh, okay, great. So I have one last question. And, uh, so, um, what, um, what if anything would you do differently in your qualitative studies, you know? Uh, what have you learned that uh, you could advise future researchers doing cooperative inquiry into transpersonal themes uh, or themes you know, pertaining to human condition, human experience? Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a great question. What would I do differently? Um, I, I mean, I think I alluded to um, well, actually, I didn't. This was removed from a longer version of the presentation. But some of the ways that the the inquiries here were limited were were in fact um, that it was a relatively homogeneous group in both cases. In the embodied spiritual inquiry, we were a group of CIAS students, and even though we represented different um, demographic identities and even different programs at CIIS, we were still pretty homogenous. And it can certainly be argued that we were coming from a shared intellectual background. Um, so I, I don't know if I would have done that differently. There was a purpose for that, but there are um, future researchers who want to explore that phenomenon specifically would be um, well advised to have more, more diversity or different perspectives. Um, represented in the group. That was similar in the authentic self inquiry, although I broadened from CIAS to also the Hakomi community, but still um, it can be argued that we had some pre-understandings or shared ideas of, about the, the inquiry topic that um, it would be interesting to explore with, with people who might have even um, opposing perspectives or divergent perspectives. 
Um, and, and the other piece of advice is just to, um, uh, to have a lot of flexibility, time, space, so that the inquiry, which becomes a living process, can um, unfold in the way that it wants to unfold. It, it can be done, but it's challenging to kind of crunch it into a very specific amount of time. And I've already um, been advising a couple of people who are doing cooperative inquiries and that they're running into that kind of problem. Like I set these six meetings, but then we had this whole eruption um, <laughs> about a specific uh, practice that we did or something like that. Now we don't have enough time to do all of our inquiry cycles. So to the extent that it's possible to leave it, you know, leave a lot of time, leave it open-ended. Um, and, and then the last thing is just to trust the, the process. Um, John Heron outlines that there, there are two types of um, inquiry culture or archetypes that can come forward. There's the Apollonian and the Dionysian, and the Apollonian is the like structured, pre-planned, and then the Dionysian is um, the more creative, spontaneous, emergent process that can be catalyzed as a result of just bringing people who have a shared intention and openness together. Um, so to, to trust that process and to let go for a period of time, um, at least in the midst of it, of needing to come up with, with something concrete at the end. Invariably, um, something will happen, and you, when you reflect back on it, um, you will be able to come to some kind of meaningful uh, reflection on what, what transpired. Um, yeah, I, I certainly needed needed to do that and also felt a bit of pressure to uh, be coming to some kind of concrete you know answers to the inquiry question um, but I also felt some relief in uh, kind of jumping back to your previous question that we weren't trying to find some kind of objective statement on authenticity or the authentic self so um, I could rest into the fact that you know whatever our, our process yielded would be a beautiful and meaningful and true on some level. Thank you very much, Olga. So mm -hmm. I don't have any further questions. And uh, um, <laughs> Elge, Greg, any last burning question that you may have, a quick one, before we go to the bigger? Okay, so yeah. now um, uh, the committee will uh, disconnect from this um, Zoom session to deliver briefly. And then uh, in the meantime, uh, Olga, you may want to invite any questions from the audience and I uh, will come back uh, in a few minutes. Hi everyone, I have you back on the, on the screen, yay. Thank you so much for being here and sticking with me through the, the long, long haul. It's good to see you. Um, I, I guess we will be sharp ending at three, so we probably have time for a couple of questions before they come back, if we can find them again. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? I guess you can wave at me. That's probably the easiest way. Amaya? Okay, so unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Hi. Hey, Olga, thank you so much for that presentation. It was amazing. Congratulations. Um, so I just finished my cooperative inquiry research project and, and I'm running into some problems now as I'm collecting all and going through all the data mm -hmm. that how do you separate your own opinions and experience in, you know, in, discovering what the the outcomes of the research are from the rest of the group mm -hmm. i guess you know because you're in involved in the research and you're you have so much data to go through how do you separate mm -hmm. you know do you know what i'm saying totally yeah yeah that was another um limitation that i didn't speak to but my my first answer is you don't you can't separate yourself from it that's kind of the point um that you as co-researcher are just as much a part of the the inquiry process um and the other piece is to involve your co-inquirers um at various stages 
uh, I'm not sure if you did this, but in my processes, we multiple times um, stopped, you know, and reflected, what are we learning about the authentic self? And so that was a part of the data set that I was then later analyzing. Um, so that, that can sound a little bit confusing, but basically I had the group's um, meta perspectives already integrated into the, the overall data that I was later looking at. And then I brought all of that um, back to the group and we had a dialogue around, does this feel true for you? Um, you know, what would you change? What would you emphasize? Um, what doesn't resonate? And the thing is that in cooperative inquiry, it's also possible and totally valid to have divergent perspectives. So you might have, you might come to findings that are um, totally shared, but then there might be some that like, I um, initiating co inquirer saw it this way. And the, there were some people in the group that didn't, or, um, does that make sense? So you don't have to come to, to total agreement on anything. Um, and I'm sure you, you will in certain ways. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? So good to just see your faces. Thank you for being here. Francoise, hi. Hi, honey. Hi. Very good. Thank Excellent you. work. It's very exciting. You know, I was especially um, uh, curious what you mentioned at the end about this uh, um, inquiry being done with people of a different background, like a, comp a more of a, you know, diverse uh, mm -hmm. group. I think that would be really part two, you know, <laughs> it would be very fascinating to see how that works or what are the results of, you know, people, you know, you know, racial uh, differences or, mm -hmm. um, you know, cultural backgrounds. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the, the reality of people, where they come from and, and their, um, you know, people with trauma, with people without trauma. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, objectify people, but trying to diversify the pool of, of uh, the inquirer might be really, really interesting to see if the results are, uh, you know, similar fundamentally as a human wisdom, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm curious mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that definitely opens up um, a lot of future possibilities. Like if you have a specific topic, let's say authentic self, and then you have different, different kinds of groups, you have people from, you know, the, the diamond approach and um, kundalini yoga, or um, that's more speaking to yeah. the ideological people who have like already mm -hmm. a strong pre-understanding. And then what you're speaking mm -hmm. to people in, um, in diverse bodies or from right. diverse cultures. Um, the the yeah. trauma, not trauma thing, I'm starting to feel like everybody's traumatized in one way or another um, these days. Uh, but uh, yeah. there, yeah, it opens a lot of possibilities mm -hmm. for the future to then compare and contrast, yeah. like you were saying, what is yeah. like maybe, um, I wouldn't make a claim for universal human knowledge, but at least, um, you know, moving toward that within this current time space context. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody, anything else? Let's see. Good to see you, Francesca. <laughs> Hi in Spain. Um, and Rachel, you waved. Yeah, I have a, well, kind of a question or a comment, being pretty ignorant of the subject till right now, but trying to understand what you're talking about. It seems to me that the richness lies in the experience for the participants mm -hmm. and their connection and their intimacy and their seeing how they're similar and they're different as much as in any result that you would write down or share outside the group. Yes. Yeah. Like absolutely. an experiential process and maybe most of the value or a big part of the value is just in the process and the impact of the process on the people who participated in it. Yeah. But I think say research or, or there's a result and I'm kind of wondering what, what do you do with the results or what's the mm -hmm. purpose of having the result? 
Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I'm, I'm nodding my head um, emphatically because you're totally right. And since it sounds like you didn't come in with much knowledge of the, the subject, I feel like I have taught you well because that's, that's actually uh, right on that the, the transformation, the experiential process for um, co-inquirers is primary in, in a big way. But the value of the, the research and um, I guess what I'm speaking to there is later having some retrospective reflection on, so what was all of that about? What did we learn? Um, and the, the value of that is to extend it to other people who might not have been a part of the process. Um, I think ideally, uh, you know, that piece of work and, you know, I'll send you my article and see if it does anything for you, but ideally that piece of work could, could spark something in the, uh, readers and the audience of the research um, might inspire curiosity and might inspire some kind of resonance that feels, um, you know, normalizing or healing. Um, so that's the, the value. And what you do with it, I guess, at least in, in this context, is um, publish it in <laughs> venues where people are going to look for this kind of thing, um, like the journals that my articles um, or our articles will be in. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, so thank you oh, for the questions. Sorry, I, we missed them. We're waiting for Greg to uh, re-emerge into our screen. Okay. Maybe he's having trouble connecting, but uh, since we just deliver, uh, we can represent his voice, uh, Helga and I, and uh, um, deliver. And also, we had, of course, read and discussed your dissertation before. And uh, we are all the three of us happy to uh, to approve to pass uh, the dissertation uh, without any uh, further change or uh, even minor changes. And this is already. Uh, uh, another quite exceptional thing at CIS, in which most dissertation gets passed with uh, some minor changes. The quality of this dissertation, the quality of the writing, um, you know, we don't have any 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 further query or or request from from the work. So um, we just simply oh, Greg is here, wonderful. <laughs> we uh, want to. Uh, Congratulate you, Dr. Olga Sommer. And uh, please uh, unmute so we can uh, all give a big applause to Olga. If you can unmute. <laughs> Thank you. This is the moment where, in, in person, the dissertation defense, Olga would open a bottle of champagne, you know, and they invite us to a toast. But unfortunately, we cannot do that. Uh, so we will leave it here, and um, Olga, you know the only thing pending uh, is technical review, and then circulating the paperwork through us, and uh, and uh, hopefully you are going to be celebrating this with all your friends and loved ones because you really deserve uh, a big celebration for this amazing accomplishment. Yay! Thank you so much. It was. Such a, an honor and actually fun to share. I, I was able to tap into that after all this all this time to be able to share with you all and to see your faces and um, yeah, to future celebrations. And thank you, Jorge, for holding the space and um, guiding the process the whole way. Thank you. Any last words, Helge, Greg? Congratulations, Dr. Somer. Have a great day. Celebrate in some way. I'll have to bow out. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Bye-bye. Wonderful. So, um, yes, celebrate and uh, take a good rest. And uh, and so great to see uh, all of you. Uh, so many good good friends here. Francois Borsat, I can see you there. It's so good to see you and, and so many of you. So thanks so much for everybody for coming. And uh, have a great, great day or night, depending on what part of the world you are. Uh, it's almost uh, midnight here. So I think I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> <laughs>
Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Good to see everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats, Olga. Yay. Congratulations, Olga. Thank you so much. Yay. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> take the night. Celebrate. Yes, yes, you will. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. And